right. Well, it's, I, thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, I tend to walk around a little bit and I don't like to stand in one place. So um, if you can't hear me or um, I'm not clear on what I'm saying, please just interrupt. Um, this is very informal and I want to make it engaging and fun and I want you to go home and have learned something from this. So first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got started in, in taking care of geriatric patients. I was seven when I wanted to do three things in my life. I told my mother, I said, I wanted to fly a plane. And she said, okay, that, okay, that's good, but what are you gonna do with that? I said, well, maybe I'll be a pilot. And she said, okay, that's, that's okay. It sounds like that might be a fun thing to do and very, you know, engaging and you make you happy. Or I said, I think I wanna be an orthodontist too. I like taking care of people and I like talking to people and I like just all, I like teeth. I'm a big tooth person and you'll hear me talk in my, t my discussion today about how important your teeth are. Um, but then I spent time with an orthodontist and I was like, I can't take this. I am looking in people's mouths, the stinky mouth, the dirty teeth. I'm not talking to them because they're, my hands are in their mouth. So I don't want to be an orthodontist. My third thing that I thought about doing was geriatrics. And I said, I just, I loved my grandpa. I loved my grandma. And I was the little girl in the grocery store who just vacillated towards any old person. And I would say, oh, they're so cute. Such, so, such a cute Grammy or Grampy. Um, and now, if you look at my age, I have nine more years that I'm going to be that person because I'm 56 years old and I'm going to be considered a geriatric patient at age 65. How, so what happened was I decided I wanted to be a nurse and geriatrics was what really interested me. So I went to nursing school, um, worked on a cardiac floor for about six years and then I went on to work for primary care geriatrics for another six years. And in that capacity, I provided primary care for geriatric patients or older patients. Um, and it was part of what we call a PACE site, which is a program, all-inclusive care for the elderly, that we have one here in Worcester. It's called Summit Elder Care. You might have heard about it. Um, when I started, I was the first full-time provider as a nurse practitioner for them. And now there's multiple sites, and it's a national program. So I did that for six years and then I decided to go back to my, my roots at UMass Memorial Medical Center where I ended up taking a job working for medicine where I took care of a lot of different age groups ranging from 17 year olds all the way up to the old of the old. But that started to get kind of, I don't know, matter of fact and I really wanted something exciting and something that really I felt good about and I could go home and feel like I really made a big difference. So I ended up getting into trauma and I ran into Dr. Michael Hirsch in the elevator one day and I had actually applied for the job and you know it's always who you know in life, uh, who you get to talk to and I had this conversation with him and I said you know I really want to do trauma. So he said you know send your CV to me and we can try to get, get, get together with the trauma team and talk about maybe getting a job with us. So I did, I went through the multiple interview process and here I am, 18 years later, I'm doing trauma. And on the trauma service, I've spent a lot of my efforts in geriatrics and just trying to make life better for people as we age. And you know, we're all living a lot older. And that, that goes to a lot of things that are happening in the environment and I think that you know, you being here today and listening to what I have to say is, is good because it's teaching you and you're going to take something home. Maybe it's, maybe it's one thing out of this lecture that's going to make you think and maybe change a habit that you have or a lifestyle change or you might pick up a new hobby. Um, and these are things that all will help you to live longer and to be happy and enjoy life. So with that, I'm gonna start. All right, so here we have the discussion's gonna talk about, I don't wanna get old. What happens to our body as we age? Well, nobody wants to get old, right? And we, we fight it. We just, 
we don't like it. Um, but it is going to happen. So I'm going to talk about the bodily changes, just in lay terms. I'm not going to get into the physiology. I'm going to make it very easy for you folks to understand. I'm going to discuss about how to age gracefully. And I'm going to discuss what we can do to stay young and prevent harm. Now, you spelling the uh, winners out there, you might say, I think she has a typo in the slide, aging. So aging can be spelled two ways, A-G-E-I-N-G and A-G-I-N-G, because um, the A-G-E-I-N-G is the way the UK spells aging. Um, but it's also acceptable in the United States. So if I used it both ways throughout my, my slides. Um, I say that I use aging with an E because aging is expected, right? But we, we want to be excellent. That's what the E stands for. We want to still have the energy that we've had all of our lives. And we want to still be able to enjoy life and be able to engage in a lot of the activities that we did as a young woman or man. So with that, I'm going to move on and just show you a picture of how I think we look as we age. OK. So here on the left, obviously, we have um, an older woman. Um, but you know, she looks, she looks in good shape. I mean, she's got a few lines on her face, but those are expected. And then we have the lady on the right. And she's probably, I would say, maybe early 30s. But you know, nowadays, there's a lot of things you can do to look like that, right? I mean, you probably heard about all the things in the news that you can do to continue to keep that look. Um, there are certain things that you can't fix, but it all depends upon the pocketbook. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. OK. So what happens to the body as we age? Well, we know that we have lots of wrinkles, right? Skin wrinkles. Um, we can't help that. Uh, that's mostly genetics and physiology. I recognize you from somewhere. Are you from Auburn? No. Are you, did you teach? Okay, that's why I know you. All right, I see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, so we're gonna get wrinkled skin, right? I mean, that's, that's a given. Um, and that's just something that depends a lot upon genetics, actually. Um, some people, if they have darker skin and they have the melanin in their skin, they will age better. They will look better. So people that are Italian, I'm, I'm sure I have some Italians in the audience, um, you tend to wrinkle less. And Asian people, um, they have that deep melanin. And um, black people, they look a lot younger than their counterparts that are white Caucasian. Um, we get the graying hair. You know, we can't help that. We lose the pigment in with our skin, but we also lose the pigment in our hair. So I saw a lot. I see a lot of gray heads out there, and that's. I think that looks great. I think that's that's the way you should look. I mean, it, we shouldn't change the way we look. I mean, that's basically, I think, to conform to society's way of looking younger. But I think it's elegant, and I think gray hair is is beautiful for older people. So many, many of the things that you are going to experience as you age, and you could probably tell me stories, is that you're going to um, try to maintain a level of function that rivals younger people. But it's very difficult to actually do that. Um, you know, our energy decreases. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So you talk about there's the young 80-year-olds, and then there's the inordinately old 40-year-olds, OK? Once people that take care of themselves, that engage in activities, get regular health checkups, take vitamins, don't smoke, eat the right foods, get enough sleep, those are our young 80-year-olds. Those are the people that you know have the energy. They, they're going to live a long and fruitful life. And then you have the old 40-year-olds that are, just don't take care of themselves and are doing drugs and don't eat well and um, live in poverty and don't engage in any um, activities that help to bring them enjoyment and they don't work, which gives them a, a sense of satisfaction. Um, so it's really important that as we age, 
we keep that in mind. We ha doesn't mean we stop doing things. It means we continue to keep moving and not stop. All right, I'm just going to do some shuffling here. All right. So I'm going to talk about what happens to the skin as we age. So I will tell you that those of you have, that have sat in the sun and um, have a history of being nice and tan and looking great all your life, this is when you're going to feel the consequences and see the consequences of that. So sun exposure is going to make you look older. It's going to cause your skin to wrinkle roughen and it's going to cause modeling of the skin. So different colors of your skin. Your skin's not going to be all the same color. And that's caused by years of sun exposure, which we can actually prevent by using protection, such as like long sleeve clothing, hats, and sun protection. Uh, but it is certainly something that is fun and makes you look healthy when you're younger, but definitely can add to um, a very older complexion as you age. Two areas of the body that actually are more likely to be exposed to sun are the face and neck. So everybody every day should wear some type of sun protection on their face and neck. There's a lot of creams out there now that actually have it built right in and just pop it right on. It takes two minutes. It's, it's clear. It doesn't produce any color. Um, and it's usually pretty good. And um, there are sensitive products out there if you're very sensitive to SPF products. But I would recommend putting sun protection on your face and neck. So back to generics, we talked about this a little bit earlier and about the dark skin and the melanin. The melanin in your skin, which makes your skin darker, actually resists sun damage. So that is just something that we can't change. Um, your, your counterparts that look, uh, that have melanin, dark skin, are going to look younger. Uh, and again, this type of skin deteriorates much later in life. Now some things are things that we can't really get rid of, okay? There are lines that you're just gonna acquire on your face that are from smiling. You get those smile lines or those little furrows, those little um, lines between your nose and upper lip and it's just everything caused by facial expression. You know, sometimes some people raise their forehead so therefore you have all these lines on your forehead um, that start very light and then as with time get deeper and deeper because you continue to do that motion. I'm going to talk about a little later um, how we can stop those things from happening or we can cover up that stuff. Um, so elastin fibers in the skin, uh, they loosen over time and that's when the skin sags. The skin is stretched when facial muscles move in a characteristic expression. So around 40 is when we start to develop those characteristic expression lines that you, you're going to have on your face. Um, and we all have as we age. And like I said, we'll talk about how to combat that or how to get rid of those, those things a little bit, bit later in the conversation. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the layers of the skin, just so that you have a little bit of the physiology with the skin. We have the outer layer of the episkin, which is the epidermis. And this is a layer of the skin that's very, um, it's very thick, and it provides a waterproof barrier, and it creates our skin tone or our skin color. This is the layer of skin that produces the melanin that I was telling you guys about. And the melanin is that um, pigment that protects the skin from sunlight by absorbing the light. And then be beneath the dermis, now the epidermis I should have said is the top yellow uh, part of the slide. And then the pink layer there, that's the epidermis. And this contains really tough connective tissue. That's where your hair follicles and sweat glands are. Also in the dermis, I'm, I'm sorry, in the epidermis, um, you will have different layers uh, within the epidermis depending upon uh, your fat content. Um, and that will depend upon the subcutaneous tissue that is in the last layer of skin. So the subcutaneous tissue so serves as a shock absorber 
and an insulator, and that, that actually protects you against your internal organs and controls your body heat. So just, uh, just kind of a little bit of an example so you can understand what the skin layers are. There are three layers, epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous tissue. And these layers will thin as we age. So what happens to skin as we age? So the skin becomes fragile, right? It tears easier, it becomes translucent. You can almost see through the skin. That's because the epidermis and the dermis thin out. The skin may feel rough. The cells in the outermost layer of the epidermis, which is that top layer, are not replaced as quickly. So it takes longer for the skin to heal as we get older. There are fewer sebaceous glands. Those are the glands that are located in the subcutaneous tissue that actually give uh, oils to the skin. So you have decrease in sebaceous glands, which actually lubricates the skin. So you'll notice that you have drier skin than you did as when you were in your younger years. Collagen and elastin, um, this is connective tissue, becomes uniform and are replaced with fibrous tissue. And then sweat glands diminish with age. So you have decreased body odor, believe it or not. Um, old people, my mother used to always say, I don't sweat under my arms, I just sweat below my lip. She said, I stop sweating under my arms. I say, you, you, you're crazy, but you should still put on your deodorant. Um, so yeah, it does, it decreases. You have a decrease ability to perspire and to regulate body temperature, which means that's kind of dangerous if you think about it. If your body can't regulate temperature as well as it did when you were younger, you really want to protect yourself from that sun and you can get overheated very fast. And in, um, con contrary to that, your body can actually get cold faster than other people, okay? So this is all due to aging, the great aging that we're all going through. And then lastly, the body is not able to produce vitamin D the way it was. And we're gonna talk about that later. I want all of you to go home and take your vitamin D and talk to your primary care about that because we're all deficient in vitamin D, whether we want to admit it or not. And it's not, it's not expensive and it's, it's good for you. It helps with your bones and a lot of other things that we're gonna talk about. All right, here's the good part. We're gonna talk about reversing wrinkles. All right, so I talked about the pocketbook. All righty, so are you guys ready? Here we go, creams. There are a bunch of creams on the market that market themselves that you're gonna look younger, okay? If way back in your day, I think that the number one cream was maybe Oil of Olay, and I think a lot of you probably still use that, and that works fantastic. It does, it really does. But what that does is it only moisturizes the outer layer of your skin. There's a lot of other things that come into play when we talk about skin and keeping it moist and keeping it younger looking. Um, there's a vitamin A on the market that's retin A. You probably have heard of the retinoids that we use. And that actually does have some good effect on skin and making the skin look better. And the way that works is it increases the thickness of the epidermis, that outer layer. So Retin-A will actually thicken that outer layer. So that's absolutely amazing. Um, it also helps skin turnover, so it helps the cells turn over faster. So you don't have that, that the same skin. It makes, kind of roughens up the skin a little bit. You might get dry skin from the Retin-A, but those cells are turning over and therefore are giving you fresh skin, if you will. Something that you can't achieve without this type of a vitamin. Um, so it's not cheap. I mean, Retin-A is expensive and it's usually, you need to get it by a prescription by a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon or your PCP. Um, it's not covered un under insurance because everybody wants it, you know? I mean, it is used for acne for young people um, and it does, it does also work wonders for that. Dermabrasion, you probably heard of this. Um, this is something that you can have done in an office. Um, it's an outpatient procedure and what they do, it's a spinning wheel that removes the outer layer of your skin. Um, it's not 
it's not comfortable, it actually hurts, and you need to protect yourself from the sun afterwards. You're going to have a very reddened face, but it's going to do similar things that the Retin-A did. So it's going to do, like, turn over that top layer of skin that we talked about. And then there are chemical peels, which are very tough on the skin. Um, and that's actually using acid on the skin. It's, I, don't ex I don't recommend that at all. Um, I've seen and heard and read about many things that have happened that are bad with acid on the skin, and especially for older people, because your skin is so thin and it can cause deformity. So I'm going to say that's not a really good idea. Uh, there's collagen, but that's very expensive. You can actually have collagen injected into your skin, but that's not going to last. Collagen is something that's going to help make you look fuller. Um, it's, in an, it's injectable. It's in a syringe, and you pay for you pay for it per like cc, or how much you're actually going to be getting in that particular area. Um, it looks good for a while. But, you know, it's temporary. It's, it's going to go away. So, again, if you have the money and you, you go into something special or you, you won the lottery or you, you, you want to impress your boyfriend or girlfriend, then you go get your collagen injections. But I, I don't think that that's... I, I also am not a believer that that is a way to deal with aging. I think aging is beautiful. And I think just taking care of our bodies is the main thing that we need to do. And then, of course, is cosmetic surgery. We can do the facelifts, the eye lifts, neck tight tightening, and fat transfers. I will say that fat transfers are something that um, does last. Fat transfers is when they liposuction some part of your body. Um, and uh, if you have, say, some stomach fat that you want to get rid of, they'll take the stomach fat from your body, and they can inject it in your cheeks to make your cheeks look puffier. Or they can give you a little bit more breast tissue or, you know, put a little here in my bum so I have a nice round bum. Um, again, that's a very, very expensive procedure. It does work. It does last. But I will say it lasts only if you don't lose weight. Because you lose weight, that, co that, co uh, that fat that you've put in other places is going to sag. You, this is, that lady right there is correct. It's going to sag. It's not going to look like you want it to look. So. Just some things that you can do if you have money. But I, I personally, I think aging is beautiful, as I said, and I'm going to continue to say that throughout my talk. But if you folks just think that you want to do that, you go right ahead. <laughs> All right, let's talk about prevention. Um, I think I, I'll start moving around a little bit quicker, I think. I think I'm talking too much, and I don't want to hold up your, your lunch time. Prevention. So what can we do to prevent aging of our skin? Well, I think it's very simple. Um, we want to protect our skin. And I talked about earlier, you know, you want to put on the hats. You want to put on the long sleeve shirts, the sun protection. You want to avoid going out into the sun between the hours of 10 and 2. Um, you want to reduce exposure time. You just, you don't want to be out there in the sun if you don't have to be. Um, because even though we like it and it feels good on our skin and it is good for vitamin D, it also can hurt our skin. So you really have to think about being responsible, making sure that you apply some type of um, lotions to protect yourself, not, even in, not just in the summer, but in the winter as well, because rays can still pass through the sun and you can still get a sunburn in the summertime. Ask my husband. He just got back from skiing in Stowe um, in Vermont. Um, it was 73 degrees on Sunday. And he was skiing in shorts. I should have put a picture up there. Skiing in shorts and a t-shirt. And he looked absolutely crazy because he had his skis on and his boots and his helmet. But he came home and he was red as a beet. And I said, I told you. <laughs> but you know, I can only preach. But I can't make people do things. There's two, two types of, um, of lights that, where you, that come from the sun. There's the UVA light and there's the UVB light. So the UVB light is responsible for producing sunburns. And actually, this causes the, the bad cancer called melanoma. Okay, This is the malignant melanoma, this UVB light. The v, UVA light plays a greater role in premature aging. 
So it causes more wrinkles to form if, you, if you're getting that type of sunlight. And again, protect yourself. You wear clothing, stay out of the sun between 10 and 2, and put on the lotions and creams because this will make a difference in your skin. And it's never too late to start either. All right, we're going to move on to the musculoskeletal system, and I'm going to talk a little bit about sarcopenia. You probably haven't heard this term, but what sarcopenia is, it's the loss of skeletal muscle as we, um, as we age. We, are, we actually lose skeletal muscle, and this predisposes us to a lot of things. When we lose muscle, we're prone to falls. Um, we have decreased bone density. We can get diabetes more easily. And we can have a decreased tolerance to heat and cold that I had talked to you about earlier. Um, you know, our body can't adjust to the heat and cold. Uh, this happens generally over the age of 65. Uh, men lose more muscle mass over their lifespan than women do. Okay, I, I don't know why, it just, it's, it's just a thing. Um, and also, you have this alteration in your basal metabolic rate. So the calories that you burn at rest change because of your muscle mass. So when your muscle mass declines, you need fewer calories to feed you. Um, so this begins to decline, believe it or not, in young adulthood, as early as if your 40s. Um, you'll notice that you can't eat as much because you're putting on the weight. It's all going to your, your belly. Um, you just don't feel like you, you can put as much food in as you used to, and that's because you have lost bone mass, and therefore you have slow, slowed down your metabolic rate. A couple other things, our posture. Our posture changes as we age, and this is caused by compression of the vertebral discs in our back. Um, you can, when you have osteoporosis, and osteoporosis is loss of bone, um, you can actually break a bone in your vertebral body just by rolling over in bed. It's, it's amazing. So if you have been diagnosed with osteoporosis and you have back pain, you may have a, a fracture. And we call that like a, a cult fracture. It's not something that was caused by something that I see my patients for, like a trauma. It's something that is just because you don't have the bone density. And so we'll talk about how we can help prevent that. Um, but you will have a change in your posture. You will change, have a change in your height. The vertebral discs can compress. You know, you have all those discs in your back from your cervical spine. The seventh cervical vertebrae is that bone when you put your head down that sticks out. And then the next bone starts your thoracic vertebrae, which you have 12 of. And then you have your lumbar vertebrae and your sacrum. Um, and those can, those can just compress because they're so thin. Um, and that changes your posture and your height. So people in their 80s oftentimes have three less inches than they did when they were younger. So you will expect that that will happen. And we're going to talk about ways to combat that because believe, you know this part of this discussion is to talk about aging gracefully. So I want to give you a few tips on even now what you can do to prevent posture and to prevent height changes. So let's move on and talk about that a little quickly here. So prevention. I cannot, I cannot recommend calcium and vitamin D enough. Very, very important. It is so important for bone health. Um, you know, some of us can get it in our food items, in the milk we drink, in our dairy products. Um, but it's, it's, if it's not contraindicated and your primary care agrees with taking a calcium and a vitamin D supplement, I'm going to say, please do. Um, make it a priority. You don't have to buy the most expensive one on the market. Just get the generic one. Walmart has the cheapest medications. Um, your insurance often doesn't pay for it. But you know, go out there and get your, your calcium and your vitamin D. And everybody should take at least 500 milligrams of calcium twice a day. And I do recommend 2,000 international units of vitamin D daily. 
um, and we should take that all year round. There's different combinations, and your primary care can talk to you about it. Some of you might be on a 50,000 unit vitamin D pill that you take once a week. Um, so it all depends upon what's easiest for you. But the calcium is something you need to take every day. There's, there's nothing that's going to help give you the bone strength more than in calcium. And then exercise, especially weight-bearing exercise is what we really want you to do because this is what's going to build bone mass. So I know some of the patients, some of you guys were coming back from exercise class today. Is there anybody in here that went to exercise class? Great. So hopefully over there you did some bone building ex exercises because it's very important to maintain your bone health. Um, I'm not saying cardiovascular isn't important either. It, it is. It's good for your heart, but we have to get both. We have to get both the bone building exercising as well as the cardiovascular. So good for you. Keep that up. That's very important. At least two or three days a week is what I would recommend. I'm going to move on to the heart. So I know heart disease as we get older, you know, it's, it's a pretty big killer out there for us. Um, so what does the heart do? So the heart transports nutrients and waste from all cells in the body. Okay, so it, we kind of need the heart. The heart is a muscular pump. So what does the pump do? It brings oxygen from the lungs. It also brings nutrients from the digestive system, hormones from the endocrine glands, and antibodies from the immune system to all the cells in the body and it returns waste products from the cells to the lungs, which we breathe out, and the kidneys, which we urinate out, through the blood. So it's, it's a very easy process if you think about it in that terms. I mean, obviously the physiology is a lot more deep than I really want to get into for this lecture. But I will say that the heart does lose efficiency as we age, and we can, we can help maintain a strong heart by keeping active and exercising. So kudos to all of you that are exercising and went to class this morning. I would continue to do that and I, I wish you well. I think it's the best thing that you can do for each other. So let's talk a little bit about the changing with aging with our heart. So what do we have? We, it's more difficult to sustain higher levels of exercise, isn't it? You know, I know that when I was 18 and in college, I could run 10 miles. I was fine. You know, now, not just because of my heart, but um, I just don't have the stamina to go out there and run 10 miles. I'm tired. It's exhausting. You know, I even, I, so I, I like my brisk walking. I, I try to get out and run when I can, but, you know, my knees now and my back, and then I just don't have the time and... You know, if you just keep active, keep the body moving, it's harder to achieve maximal exercise tolerance. Okay, it's really hard because we don't have the we don't have the stamina and we don't have the drive and we don't have the the energy and we just don't feel like doing it. So we don't it's hard to really stick to an exercise program as we age. I mean, it's easier to say, well, I'm old and I'm just going to just do what makes me happy, which I want everybody to do. We have to be happy and enjoy every day in life. But exercise is so important. Um, exercise will decrease your maximal heart rate, which will make your heart stronger. Um, but what does happen is the walls of the heart thicken. The heart gets bigger. It gets bigger as we age. So you all have such a big heart. Um, your heart valves become stiffer and they calcify. Um, we can't do much about that. It's just, it just, it happens. A lot of it's related to genetics. Um, your, your electrical activity of your heart, your pacemaker cells don't, cells don't act the way they normally would act. And your arteries become thicker. And believe it or not, arteries do not come, become thicker. That is not associated with lifestyle. And I'll get into that in a minute. I will have time at the end to answer questions, but if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me if it can't wait. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lymphatic and immune system. So the two major functions of the lymphatic system and the immune system 
are to collect excess fluid from around the cells and return it to the bloodstream. It's a protective system. It has lymph nodes throughout the body that contain immune cells that inactivate bacteria and viruses and filter foreign matter from body fluids. There's two other organs of the lymphatic system that I just want to talk about briefly that you've probably heard of, and that's the thymus, which is not really well understood. That sits in the middle of your chest. That actually plays an important role in the immune system and because it produces a large number of lymphocytes, and these are blood cells that produce substances that destroy foreign cells. Um, the thymus, it's, it's kind of a weird gland, if you will. It actually gets smaller as you get older and can almost disappear in your older years. And we don't really need it. The rest of the body takes over. And then you have the spleen. Um, I, I believe that there's got to be at least one person in this room who does not have a spleen. Anybody in here? Spleen, a, with an asplenectomy? Asplenic? No? All right, well, you can't live without a spleen, okay? The spleen is an important organ, but when the spleen fails, because the spleen is also one of the largest organs of the lymphatic system, and it is located right under your left rib here. It's like fist size, and it can get damaged very easily when you break your lower ribs. Um, so just something to think about. We always worry about that in trauma, that you can rupture your spleen or you can have a different, um, whether it's a stage one versus stage five, which is the worst splenic laceration you can have, um, just from those ribs poking that, that tissue. But we can live without spleens because the liver will take over and other parts of the body will take over and we get immunized um, with the uh, four immunizations that the spleen we lose when we don't have our spleen. And those are things that your primary care would give you and you would get repleted um, on a schedule. Um, but you first, your first vaccines, vaccines are four vaccines if your spleen is removed and then you don't have to worry about that for another five years. And then I think that's about done. The CDC is constantly coming out with different recommendations to how to treat people that do not have spleens. But it's not the end of the world. Um, some of the age-related changes of the lymphatic system, you're at higher risk for infection than the rest of the population. So I see some masks in the room. Um, I, I think that's good. Uh, I think that you're protecting yourself and others. Um, you're protecting yourself from what you could get from others and you're protecting others from what they could get from you. So we need to be careful that we, are, you as elders, um, are at higher risk of infections. And the other thing is your antibodies don't respond as vigorously. So they're a little slower uh, than the younger bodies. So it, it's very important to stay healthy and to eat right and to protect yourself, um, especially with these masks going away. I will give you a tip. Don't go to the, gro don't go, not the grocery store, don't go to the pharmacy without a mask because people in the pharmacy are there because they're sick, right? You go to the pharmacy to get some meds. So do not, do not go without a mask. I wear a mask in the pharmacy. I, you know, sometimes I look silly, but you know, it is what it is and I want to protect myself and protect other people from something I might be, be able to give them. Just a little bit more about the lymphatic system and then we're gonna move on to the really good stuff. All right, so I liked this chart that I have here. Um, our bodies are, a const are in a constant battle with foreign invaders and use many mechanisms to defend themselves. The skin that we talked about, that provides the strongest barrier towards microorganisms. So taking care of your skin, diabetics, checking your feet, making sure you don't have any ulcers, making sure if you get cut, you treat thing, your cut appropriately. If you're concerned, you're seen by a physician. Um, stomach acid deactivates organisms that we may swallow. 
So we have gastric juices. Our stomach's very gas, it's very acidic. So if we swallow something that we shouldn't have swallowed, um, our body is going to dissolve that and protect you. So it's, that's what the belly does. Those gastric juices serve a purpose. Some people have an overproduction of gastric juices and need to take medications to help combat some of the symptoms such as GERD or reflux, but stomach acid will help to deactivate those bad organisms that you might breathe in from somebody that's coughing, um, somebody that has the flu or has an infection they're on that they're transporting to you. Um, enzymes of the mucous membranes inactivate invaders. So the mouth, any mucous membrane, the mouth, the nose, and I will also say the vagina, it does inactivate invaders, okay? It's, 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 it's an acetic environment and it will protect you from getting ill. White blood cells are specialized cells that destroy foreign bodies, and this, these are the most important cells in the body, and these help to protect the immune system. I want to talk about the respiratory system, and then I'm going to talk a little bit the digestive system, and then I'm going to get into some age-related changes of the urinary system and the nervous system, but I think I'm going to move quickly along. I don't want to bore you. I'm, I'm trying to give you good information to take home, um, and I, I hope that you're enjoying what I have to teach you today. All right, so let's move on to the respiratory system. All right, what time is lunch? Oh, I must, I must move on very quickly then. All right, the respiratory system. So I think we all know that we need to breathe, right? It's very important. Um, what does the respiratory system do? Well, its major function is it transfers oxygen from the air into the bloodstream, and it removes carbon dioxide from the bloodstream into the environment. It's constantly exposed to pollutants. It's, different, it's difficult to differentiate between respiratory deterioration due to age or that that it might be caused by pollutants. The main effective age in the respiratory system is reduced amount of oxygen taken up by the blood. Um, things can help expedite um, this, such as smoking, which we don't want to do because this is going to make our breathing a lot more difficult. Um, the most consistent change in the breathing is the vital capacity, and that's the amount of air that you can actually take in, and that decreases with age, so you can't take as much air in. Um, so just something to think about. You get winded a lot easier. That's where the aerobic exercise come in, comes in and trying to get strong and use your other um, muscles to strengthen the lungs. So what I would recommend is a regular exercise program. Everybody should do something. It doesn't have to be anything that's structured. It can be something that is just like I go out and I walk three times a week. I walk, I do a couple blocks, um, a couple times around the block. Um, try to get your heart rate up. You know, do it safely, put good shoes on. The sidewalks in Worcester are terrible. So um, I don't advise you walking in the road, but I want you to pay attention to your each step. And I wanna make sure that you don't trip and fall. Um, if, you're, if you feel that you don't have good balance, then I would recommend joining a gym or going to the Y or maybe some places that you live have exercise equipment that's accessible to you. Um, so exercise, very important. I talked about the bone building exercises, equally important. And then no smoking, no smoking. We don't want to smoke. That is actually going to do a lot of bad things to the body and really cause a lot of issues with aging. I'm going to quickly go through the digestive system, and then I think I'm going to quickly go through a couple other things that I want to tell you, but I, w I really want to show you this video that I thought was really f fun to see. And it's only five minutes, um, so I, I start it now. <laughs> I promise that I'm, I'm going to wrap this up quickly so that you can get your lunch, okay? I know it's important to you. Food is important to everybody. Um, 
But, you know, there are changes in the digestive system. I will just say that um, the digestive system, uh, each portion plays a role and it helps to break down food um, and stores, there is some typos that I noticed in this and I apologize. Um, it helps absorb the nutrients and stores the waste products until elimination. But there's few age-related changes in the digestive system. Um, so these, this is just a slide just telling you that there's uh, less pepsin produced. Um, pepsin is an enzyme that actually breaks down proteins in digestion. Um, you don't have a good absorption of calcium, iron, and iron vitamin B1, and B12. Um, and here we go with the tooth loss. The most important change that affects digestion is tooth loss. And a lot of elders substantially um, had tooth loss and it increased since the 1950s that people are now maintaining their natural teeth. Um, so what is tooth loss associated with poor oral hygiene? Um, people that tend to have higher educational levels actually have um, better tooth care because they can afford dental care. They can af afford um, good oral hygiene. Um, advanced age, you can't help that you have receding gums, you have more tissue that's exposed, but that can be helped with good hygiene. And teeth wear down over a lifetime. But the good news is that today's children and young adults are getting the fluorinated water and they're getting the dental checkups and they're getting the calcium and vitamin D and they are actually retaining their teeth. Uh, this is a picture that I'm going to show you of the urinary system. It just shows you the kidneys and it shows you the ureters, and that's the tube that transports the urine to the bladder. Um, and then the bladder is just a mus muscular sac that actually holds the urine until you're ready to expel it. Usually you have to expel it when you develop about a pint of urine in your, in your bladder. Um, I'm gonna skip over this. This is age-related changes of the kidneys. Um, the nervous system, um, so, there, I just want to talk maybe briefly, we'll just talk about the cerebellum and the cerebrum. So, there's two big areas in the brain, and each area has a special purpose. Um, the cerebrum is responsible for intellectual activities such as speech, thought, learning, memory, and reasoning. It also interprets messages from the organs and controls voluntary muscle action, where the cerebellum this coordinates voluntary muscle movement. It actually, the cerebellum determines how we balance ourselves. And it helps to maintain muscle tone, posture, and equilibrium. There's a lot of different changes um, of aging of the um, nervous system. Um, obviously, cognitive is, is one of them. Um, the cognitive functions include three major themes, crystallized intelligence, which is the end product of all the things that you've learned in your life. Um, this increases through the 60s and 70s sometimes. Sometimes you can actually get smarter as you get older. But it does tend to decline in late age. <laughs> and then memory and speed declines in early adulthood. And as you get old, 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 it, it declines very quickly in steeper old age. Right. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of slides. Um, we know that we have changes in vision, hearing, taste and smell, balance and equilibrium, and somatic receptors, so the way we respond to touch, pressure, heat, pain, cold, body position, and space are all different as we get older. Um, and this is, affects every individual in different ways. Uh, the endocrine system, we talked a little bit about that. Hormones decrease with age. Um, your thyroid hormones decrease. Many of you might be on medications for thyroid. Um, menopause begins in the 40s and you start to decline. And andropause, which is the, what men go through, is where they lose testosterone, which starts as early as the 40s as well. Okay. I just want to tell you a little bit, the women. So just because, um, and this is not, and maybe this population talks about it more, but 
So you, the good news is that you can still have sexual relations as you get older, okay? It, it can take place. Um, women are still able to uh, have an orgasm with clitoral sensation, and men have a more difficult time maintaining and achieving an erection, but they can still ejaculate, and this can go well into the 80s. So I just wanted to bring that up that um, I think it's very important and I, you know, practicing primary care when I was doing geriatrics, it's an important thing to talk about. Um, I don't think, maybe your generation is a little bit kind of like, eh, this is kind of embarrassing type thing, but you know what? It's, it's life and good for you if, you're, if you have a partner and, and you're able to engage in, in that type of a relationship. All right, so I just this saying, I've noticed a couple typos in it, and then we'll get to the video, which is the fun part. Then I'm just going to roll off a few things that are going to really help you to, to age gracefully. So I like this, this um, particular line that I read. Um, Ultimate limits to human lifespan are probably fixed. The onset of illness can be delayed. I, lo I lost the D on that. So as to compress the lifetime experience of morbidity into the shortest possible period. And I, I liked that. I, I, that really says a lot. Um, so I just found that to be just nice. It's true. Um, but you got to make the best of every day, right? That's what I take away from that. Enjoy every day. It sounds a little morbid. Enjoy every day as if it's your last. But um, I think that that's very true. All right. So how do you age gracefully? Prevention, okay? You want to prevent getting old. No, you can't prevent getting old. <laughs> you want to prevent getting sick. You want to do the right things. You want to eat the right foods. Health education, your lifestyles. Um, women live longer than men. Why what? Why do women live longer? I don't know. I think cause maybe just because we're nurturing. I think we just have to live, we have to live long enough to take care of those men because if we die before the men, they wouldn't know what to do. So that's, oh, you're lost. Help this man, somebody. All right. There's little evidence that there's any single causative factor that is going to be helpful for successful aging. So here we go, guys. Staying young. This is what we need to do. This is what the literature states. Meditation, it's supposed to be good for you. Meditate, okay? This guy's a thumbs up with that one. Think as if you're still 20 years old, okay? Yeah, honestly, if you think young, you're gonna act young. Um, try new things. Don't be afraid to get out there and you know jump out of a plane or I don't know. Do something fabulous that you've always wanted to do. Stay active, get enough sleep. Sleep when you want to sleep. You might not sleep all night. Take naps during the day. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, look, look after your telomeres. So what does this mean? Telomeres are DNA protein structures that actually help play a big role in healthy weight, healthy eating, quit smoking, enough sleep, help with managing residual stress, um, a diet high in vitamin C. Um, and you want to make sure that you get your vitamin C and you get your phenols. The phenols are your berries, your cocoa, your coffee, your tea, your nuts. And you want to get your anthocyanins, which are your blueberries, your cherries, your cabbage, your grapes, your tomatoes. So just eat a very, very diet. We want to adopt a plant-based diet. Drink plenty of drink beauty and go, go skin revive. Raise your metabolism, never skip breakfast, get moving, green tea and coffee, water, and start in smart stacking. Uh, I can't talk, smart stacking. The end. All right.